If you will, we'll turn to the book of James, and we're beginning chapter 5 today. Chapter 5, verse 1, and we'll consider the first six verses in James. Uh, if you have a handout there, I think there's, hopefully there's enough. Uh, <clears throat> but let me read chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, and then we'll pray, and then we'll consider uh, James's warning uh, to those in the church uh, that misuse their wealth. So James chapter 5, verse 1. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived in, on the earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person, and he does not resist you. All right, let's pray, and then we'll consider this, this passage here. <clears throat> Father, again, we thank you so much that we can open up your word and learn from it. We learn your perfect will that you have for us. But we also understand that many times you give us warnings in here, uh, warnings and, and uh, things that we need to avoid, things we need to uh, look at. And so may we use this passage again here as a, another one of the self-examinations that we look to ourselves and the warnings that's given here as well to uh, to see if we truly love you or the things of this world we ask this in your son's name amen okay so this is again in james this is you can consider this as another test or another self-examination uh, that you use for a test of genuineness of your faith and it's, and it's who do you uh, who do you love more? Do you love money and the things it buys, or do you, do you love Jesus? So, so this is just another one in the line that we have been studying for the last several uh, weeks as well. And remember the audience that James is speaking to are these Jewish Christians, his brothers uh, in the faith of the, that have been dispersed either by persecution or uh, in the dispersion um, uh, over the years that they have been dispersed. But it would be a letter that's read in the church, uh, and you, as you can tell by the uh, language, it's, it's a pretty severe rebuke or warning to those in the church who were misusing their wealth. Um, and so the church, even the, the first century church, would certainly would look a lot different than our church with respect to times and things like that. But really a church, it, it would be similar in the manner that there's going to be tares among the wheat. There's going to be those that will give a false profession of faith and somehow attach themselves to the church, but really not have that uh, genuineness of faith. And their lifestyle, especially with respect to money, uh, is really gives strong evidence about what's important to them. I think we can all see that. Um, and so James gives this very, very uh, strong rebuke or warning on how we should handle uh, our wealth and what will happen if we prove otherwise that we are handling it, and that is our most important uh, possession as well. And really what James teaches is nothing new. It's, uh, it echoes all of Jesus' teaching about wealth. There in Matthew 6, 19, uh, this in your hand I said, you know, Jesus uh, spoke quite plainly of this. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. You can almost see that James is maybe referring to this particular uh, teaching of Jesus because he uses the same type of description. Um, and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In verse 24, he says, no one can serve two masters. For either he'll hate the one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And so possessing wealth, wealth itself is not sinful because the Lord tells us, or the yeah, the Lord tells us in Deuteronomy 8.18 that it's the Lord that gives us the ability uh, <clears throat> or the power to get wealth. Uh, 
the question is the stewardship of that wealth that he gives you. That's what's in line here. And so certainly the misuse of that wealth and the temptations that wealth brings on can be sinful. Um, Paul gives that warning in 1 Timothy uh, that for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. The love of money, not necessarily money itself, and all kinds of evils. Evils can, um, the love of other things can cause many evils as well. But it's through the craving, okay, the desire for that money, the craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. So it's the the uh, desire, the love of money, the desire to keep that money to yourself and not steward it well uh, that is in line here. And so just broadly speaking, wealth means, biblically, having more than you need. Very simple. You got what you need. If you got what you need and that's all you got, it's pretty easy. You buy what you need, you, you survive. But wealth is when you have some excess on that. And so as we... Uh, as we just mentioned earlier, God is the one that gives that wealth to you, certainly some more than others, but he sovereignly distributes this as he sees fit. Uh, but the question here is, uh, and, and in this passage, and what James is um, rebuking and warning against is how we acquire that wealth. Do we do it honestly, dishonestly? And how do we use that wealth? How do we use that um, so the question is not how much, but how we steward what we have. Uh, do we steward it to glorify God, or do we keep it for ourselves? Do we hoard it like those that he is uh, rebuking in this passage? And so, so James's rebuke here is really consistent. If, you rem- if you're doing the machine reading or read the Old Testament, there are many Old Testament prophets that rebuke exactly what James is rebuking here now. Because Israel, as you know, when they became uh, apostate, and they began, even their leaders were the ones that were defrauding the poor uh, for their own personal gain. Um, and so an example then, Isaiah uh, chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, um, I, the Lord through Isaiah says, The Lord will enter into judgment with the elders and the princes of his people. Those would be the leaders of his people in Israel. He said, this is what they're doing. It is you who have devoured the vineyard. The spoil of the poor is in your house. So they were defrauding or stealing from the poor for their own personal gain. And then he goes on to say, what do you mean by crushing my people? By grinding the face of the poor, declares the Lord, of, the Lord God of hosts. And Amos uh, kind of gives us another example again. Uh, it says, hear this. You who trample on the needy and bring the poor of the land to an end. And this is how they did it in verse 5. They were saying, when the new moon is over, uh, when will the new moon be over that we may sell grain? And the Sabbath that we may offer wheat for sale. So they wouldn't want to do the new moon festivals, the Sabbath where they couldn't sell and make money. They just couldn't wait for them to be over so they could get back to making money. It was your greedy mindset. And then this is how they did it, I guess, just consistently uh, that 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 Amos is rebuking again. It says, and it goes on in verse 5, it says, that we may may make the Ephath small and the Shekel great and deal deceitfully with false balances. So the ephah would be a, a, a bushel or a measure of weight, and the shekel would be the money they would use, and they would deceitfully make either shorthand them when they're giving them, or, uh, or uh, they would just defraud them as well with false balances and deal deceitfully. That was the rebuke against them. That's how they were making their money, and that is the rebuke that this prophet was giving to them. And so in verse 6, it, uh, it goes on to say that we may buy the poor for silver, and the needy for a pair of sandals and sell the chaff of the wheat. So they would buy the poor, I guess, into slavery as well for a small amount because they, that's all they had. And then verse 7, uh, Amos says, The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their deeds. And then the verses after that go into describing the judgment that would fall upon those uh, that were dealing deceitfully and making their, their wealth by defrauding the poor as well. 
And James' rebuke here is, 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 is really so severe that many commentators, including Matthew Henry that I read, believe that he's speaking these words to sinners outside the church. Um, but it seems more likely that really he's addressing those sinners inside the church, the ones that were, uh, that were false converts that repeatedly showed by their lifestyle what they professed was not true. Um, and, we, and, he, uh, and Jesus taught this, you know, before there, there was a church, you know, certainly in the parable of the sorrels, when he spoke of those that, that would hear the word and receive it gladly, but, you know, it never got below that rocky ground, and though it would spring up and they'd make a profession of faith, it never took root. So when things got hard, they withered away, they left. Uh, the same with the, the, the one that the seeds that fell among the thorns, okay, the thorny soil. Again, as they grew up, they, the, they had a profession of faith, but the world and the thorns would choke it out. And so the deceitfulness of riches um, would eventually overcome their love for God. So they would show what they would truly think. And all these are in Matthew 13, and we, we can read them. We've heard them before. So James really addresses those who supposedly attach themselves to the church with a profession of faith, and maybe they're self-deceived, maybe they're, maybe they're just fakers, maybe they're, they have ulterior motives for being there in the church, but, but their lifestyle really contradicts their profession of faith. And so not only is he addressing those that are doing these things that James is, is going to speak of here, but it also serves as a warning to Christians, to true Christians, to those that, that not to stumble into the same thing because of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, those things that he talked about. So we hear many times in 1 John about we do not love the world or the things of the world. Okay, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So if the world becomes your ultimate love, uh, you have to certainly examine yourself for your love of the Father. And he also tells us certainly we, if we're friends of the world, we're... We're what? We're enemies of God, right? So let's, uh, we'll proceed to the verses now, okay? So James starts off with this in chapter 5, describing the impending judgment that's going to come upon these people because they've demonstrated that the, um, what truly matters to them in the way they handle their wealth and the way they treat other people. So so he comes in in verse 1, he says, come now, and that's the same kind of introduction he said um, a few verses ago in chapter 4, verse thing. It just means listen up, this is important. Come on now, listen, this is really important. And then he gives them a command to weep and howl. Okay, weep, weep, that uh, Greek word klato means sob, lament, out loud. We see it many times in the New Testament, especially around... Funerals and people that were weeping, lamenting over the, the loss of that. Um, one example there, when Jairus' daughter, remember when Jesus came and the daughter was dead, they were all weeping and mourning for him. Um, but it can also mean, be a show of like an intense shame or guilt as evidence in Luke 7.38. And that's a story where Jesus was at the home of the, uh, the Pharisee Simon and the the, the woman, the prostitute woman, came in and poured the oil on his feet. And as she was doing it, she was weeping, weeping over her shame, over her repentance. She was standing in the, uh, the Son of God here and knew that she was a sinner. So it's, it's, it's an example of, of, of shame and guilt and, and repentance. And, and certainly it's also used in Matthew 26, 75. And that's, that's after the rooster crowed the second time and Peter wept bitterly out of the shame and the guilt that he had betrayed the, the Son of God. So it's a, it, and, uh, and, and James uses it just a, a few verses ago in chapter 4 when he said, Be wretched and mourn and weep. He said, Let your laughter be turned to mourning, your joy to gloom. He says, but then he goes on to say, Humble yourselves before the Lord. So that mourning and weeping then was followed by a, a humbling a repentance of understanding uh, what was wrong with him. But here in James, he doesn't, there's no repentance involved. He says you need to weep and you need to howl. Okay, and that word is a, 
onomatopoetic word. It's used only one time. I know there's a name for that, but I can't remember what that's called. It's used one time in the New Testament. It really means to shriek or scream. It, it's, it's, it, you're weeping, but you're screaming. So when you put this weeping and howling together, it's, it's kind of like I wrote there. It's really this intense outburst of despairing, uncontrollable grief is a way to do it because of the shame and guilt that you have been doing and what is going to happen to you because of what you are doing. So it's the same idea that, that Isaiah 13, 6, when, when Isaiah says, wail for the day of the Lord is near. You, the day of the Lord, the destruction, the, the judgment day is near. You need to, to wail. You need to, um, it, it's going to be a, uh, an intense time when judgment comes upon you. And so what's going to come upon them? And the next thing that's going to come upon these rich people, the miseries that are coming upon you. Okay, that obviously speaks of judgment and the promise of eternal punishment. It's speaking of uh, the woes. Remember when Jesus all of this, uh, declared the woe in Luke 6, 24, but woe to you who are rich, you've already received your consolation. He also had the woes when he said woe to on Bethesda and, and Chorazin. If the mighty deeds that had been done in your town had happened in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented. But you've you put that away. And he also pronounces the woes on the Pharisees. You know, you're, you look good on the outside. You're these whitewashed tomb, but inside you're dead man, dead man bones. So the same idea there. And, and, and the story that Jesus tells in Luke chapter 16, I think, is really an example of what James is speaking of here as well. What's going to happen to these rich people that are acting this way and treating people the way they're treating them. And so uh, let's read that. There was a rich man. And you've heard this, and, and this, is, this is not a parable because he uses proper names. He uses Lazarus, and so most par parables do not use names. So this is probably a story. Uh, I would say it is a story of something that happened. And, and so Jesus tells it for a reason. He says, there's this rich man who was clothed in purple, fine linen, feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores. In verse 21, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. So he desired to be fed what fell from the rich man's table, but there's never a mention of the rich man ever giving him anything. Right? He kind of withheld what he had. Lazarus was out there. And so he, uh, uh, moreover, even the dog came and licked his sores. Verse 22 says, And then the poor man died and was carried by angels to Abraham's side. So he came, went into the afterlife in a relatively... Um, comforting Abraham's side bosom like that. But then the rich man also died and was buried. Uh, but he's in Hades in torment. And he lifted up his eyes. He saw Abraham far off and Lazarus by his side in, in a relative comfort. But he's in torment now because of the way he lived his life. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in the water to cool my tongue for I am in anguish in this flame. And then Abraham said, Child, remember in your lifetime you received good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things, but now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And I think the idea there is that, that the rich man didn't do anything. He was rich. He kept it to himself. He didn't help the poor, the needy, which uh, we are commanded to do uh, by the Lord. So, so he goes on to then... James goes on to describe here why this is going to happen to them. Why are they going to face eternal uh, torment? Because the second thing there, extreme misuse of his wealth or hoarding. Uh, this is why he's going to expect judgment. This greed that this rich man demonstrated in his life. Um, chapter 2, uh, I mean chapter 5, verses 2 in the first part of 3 says, Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded. And in the King James verses, your gold and silver have rusted. Okay, same word, corroded. Things that happen when you leave metals out. So, so God gives us material goods, right? Wealth, things to use. And not to just store away and hoard them, but to use. So it's the attitude towards the wealth that God grants you that, again, is what... James is uh, condemning here as well. 
And so that the material goods and the things that God gives you, we certainly uh, are told to, first of all, provide for our family as well. And, and, and in 1 Timothy 5, 8, he says that if you don't provide those, for those in your household, you're worse than an unbeliever. So we're to provide for our, uh, for our household. But then secondly, to use it to glorify God in, in um, helping the needy, winning the lost, advancing his kingdom. Uh, pretty simple. So now consider what wealth in James' time would, be, would consist of. Certainly it would consist of land, houses, things like that. But in, in, in respect to possessions besides land and houses, it would probably refer to maybe foodstuffs, grain, like the, remember the rich fool who had, had really good crops and his barns weren't big enough. He wanted to build some more barns and he was going to live the rest of his life on that and be happy. Okay, um, but when you think about that, you consider that, what's going to happen? Those are perishable items. They're not going to hang around forever, but, but that's what this rich man is doing here, and that's what he's condemning here because he says, your riches now have rotted. Okay, so whatever it is, they're, he's not using them, and they're going away. He's not using them for any kind of good. They just sit there, and they rot. He hoards them for himself, and then Garments, you know, clothes, well, things in, in that time, some, several garments along those times would be maybe fancy garments with the embroidered and stuff. But again, they're subject to destruction by moths eating them up as well. And then gold and silver. We sometimes we think of gold and silver as being somewhat undestructible, but any metal that lays around long enough uh, is going to rust. It's going to corrode. And so that's what he's saying. And, and so James could be also uh, speaking here just in a, um, uh, in a figurative sense that those things have sat around long enough. When judgment day comes, they're going to be worthless. They're going to be just like rusted metal. They're not going to have anything to do with what happens after that. So this man is hoarding himself. Hoarding one's possessions certainly is uh, hoarding one's possessions that are given to you by God. Okay, and not using them is really foolishness because all the possessions that we have are transitory, no matter what they are. They're all fleeting, and they're not going to benefit you in the day of judgment, only, only our faith in Jesus, only the true faith that have in Jesus. So this is really a description of, of, a, of a wealthy hoarder, someone that, that does not do anything for anybody else but keeps them to the point where they rot and they go away because they're not being used. And that's not what we're commanded to do with the possessions. And then in uh, verse 3, second part of verse 3, says their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. Mm. King James says the rust of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as, as it were fire. So the, the rust and the corrosion and the moth eaten or the rust and the corrosion on that, because you did not use the possessions God gave you for something, then they, they rusted that. Now they personify that rust as a witness. It's going to witness to God what you've done with those possessions that, uh, that he had given you. So the, it acts as a witness to basically their heart, their greed, their hoarding. Their, um, and so it makes... Whatever wealth that God has provided you with, useless, useless wealth. It's just, it's rotting, it's rusting, it's, it's going away, and it serves nobody, you know, except the one who possesses it. So it wasn't held, it wasn't used as God commanded us to, to glorify him by helping the needy, advancing the kingdom, um, but it gives witness to the selfish, self-serving heart that loves money more than God. And so it becomes a witness. He personifies that, that rust that's going on it as a witness on the day of judgment. And so, so not only uh, does it uh, become a witness, but then it becomes the executioner because it says that that rust will eat your flesh like fire. Obviously, that's a uh, reference to hell, uh, you know, where the, the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched, right? Uh, and, you know, many, many uh, theologians... Um, deny hell and deny or downplay it at, the, at best, but they, they deny that it's there. But the Bible really depicts it as a, as a conscious, physical, eternal torment as what it says. And, 
and several of the, uh, and just a couple of things that, that uh, kind of bring that to light is, is in the, the one we just read in Luke 16 about the rich man and Lazarus. Just kind of consider this for a minute. Uh, in verse 23, it says, And in Hades, being in torment, okay, so to be in torment, you have to be conscious of torment, right? Okay. It says, He lifted up his eyes, so he's physically there, saw Abraham far off, and Lazarus at his side, and he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water to cool my tongue. So again, physically, he's there with a tongue, and I'm in anguish in this flame. So he's conscious of where he is and what he is surrounding. He's physically there. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 29, you know, if your right eye causes you to sin, you throw it out. It's better that, <clears throat> that you lose one eye than your whole body be thrown into hell. So it's a physical place that, you, that those will be that, that deny Christ. And then in Matthew 25, 41, when... Uh, when on the last days he's separating the sheep from the goats, sheep from the goats, he says, "Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and angels." So it's it's a con it's a real place. It's 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 a conscious place, a physical place. It's an eternal place, and it's eternal torment. And so this is a strong rebuke, a strong reminder to all of us as well uh, what lies ahead. Um, for the wicked as well. And so that also what makes this a fool as you go on to the next verse is you have laid up these treasures in the last days. So what makes hoarding so foolishness is these are the last days. These are the days from Jesus' first appearance to his coming back. How many days is that going to be? Okay, I don't know. Maybe tomorrow. We don't know. That's just the idea. We don't know when tomorrow uh, when he will come back for his church, but it makes it so, it, it's like we talked about last week, the arrogant and the prideful planner that planned his deal without, he planned his life without considering God's uh, will in any of it. Uh, it's just foolishness because you don't know what tomorrow brings. You don't know when your life will be expected of you. You do not know when Jesus is going to return to to gather his church. You just do not know. So in these last days of redemptive history, it just seems foolishness that you would not use your wealth for the purpose for which God intended it for. Uh, and all we'd be doing if we're not using it for that is storing up wrath for themselves as a day of judgment. So they're not storing up their treasures like they think they are. They're storing up the wrath uh, of God on the day of judgment. And so James, and also in, in verse 4 now, he uh, uh, convicts them, he condemns them for the way they obtain that wealth, for the dishonest acquisition of the wealth. Verse 4 says, Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. So instead of being generous to the poor and helping the needy, as the law commands, they were actually doing the opposite. They were defrauding the poor as well. Just like the Old Testament prophets we read earlier, that's what they were doing, and that's what the prophets were condemning them for and telling them judgment is going to come upon you for that. That's the same thing that James is, is uh, calling out on these rich people as well, too. And instead, so the, the laborers, the day laborers, certainly in... in um, in James's time, uh, and in our time now, it's a large, necessary part of the, the population. And certainly back then, being in an agrarian society, day laborers were necessary for planting, harvesting, everything that needed to be maintained on the crop. And so, um, and, and God had made provision for them as well. He had placed in his law there in Leviticus 19.13 and then Deuteronomy as well, he says in uh, Leviticus 19.13, he's okay, he starts out with saying, You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired worker shall not remain with you all night until morning. That means a hired worker, you pay him the day they do their work because they need it. And it goes on in Deuteronomy, he, he uh, states the same thing in a little more detail. He says, You shall not oppress a hired worker who is poor and needy, whether he is one of your brothers or one of the sojourners who are in your land within your town. So it doesn't matter if he's one of the Jews or he's, he's of other ethnicity. 
It doesn't matter if he's a laborer, it says verse 15. You shall give him his wages on the same day before the sun sets. It says, for he is poor and he counts on it. And then it says, lest he cry against you to the Lord and you be guilty of sin. And so it's pretty obvious that James kind of had this verse in mind as well when he wrote this also because he says the, the unpaid wages, again, he personifies those wages. He says these unpaid wages are crying out against you. Uh, but then he says also that, um, <clears throat> that the harvesters are crying out. Their cries have now reached the Lord of hosts. Um, some of your translations may, instead of host, say Seboeth, which means host, and kind of a, a word that just refers to all the hosts of heaven. And so if the laborers are now crying out um, uh, to the Lord of hosts, which is God who is the Lord over all the hosts, all his angels, all his angel armies, you would say, uh, then the unjust are going to, that's what they're going to face. They're going to face the armies of the Lord um, in uh, judgment as well. And so another um, uh, condemnation that James uh, reflects upon these was that they have lived their life in selfish extravagance. Um, not only did they not uh, provide for the needy, not only did they not use it for God's kingdom, but they spent it on themselves. It says, verse 5, you have lived on this earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. So they spent it all on themselves, self-indulgence, luxuriously. That self-indulgence, um, that word's used only one other time. And, it's, and interestingly enough, it, it's uh, when it's referring to the church's responsibility to provide for widows who are truly widows, uh, it mentions in there a widow that has lived self-indulgently. Um, that would not fall into that category. But it, it gives the idea, it's like the prodigal son, he gets his money and he spends it on whatever he wants. Uh, whatever his heart desires, whatever his heart desires. And the fattened hearts, uh, and I like that, that term because you can see the, the symbolism there. They're, they're self-indulgent lifestyle, okay? Um, they don't hold back anything that their heart desires and would be kind of akin to a, a fattened cow. Right before slaughter, what do they do? They give them all they want to eat so they're fatter, right? And they bring more money. Well, that's kind of what's happening. That's the idea here. Their hearts, they don't withhold anything from their hearts. Uh, and the day of slaughter, uh, they're, they're fattening their hearts up just to be slaughtered in the day of judgment. It, it's evidence against uh, where their heart is. It's becoming fatter and fatter. Now, I know a fattened heart and cardiology things is probably a bad thing as well, too. In biblical terms, it's a bad thing also. Okay, fattened your heart. Okay. So they're self-indulgent. They, they, they spend it on what they want at any time they want. And so it, it's, it's uh, who, what biblical character, you can see it on there, uh, did this same thing. I mean, he, he, wanted, he lived self-indulgently to find out what, purposer was on earth Solomon. king solomon and, and i'm just going to read ecclesiastes since we got time just ecclesiastes chapter two i just put the last couple of verses in there because i didn't have room i would have had to make another page on that so all right ecclesiastes chapter again this is king solomon he said i said in my heart come now i will test you with pleasure and just enjoy yourself and he also makes a comment then, but behold, this was also vanity. He understood that at the end, but not when he started. Verse 2, I said, I said of laughter, it's mad. And I said of, of pleasure, what use is it? He goes, I searched my heart on how to cheer my body with wine. So he indulged in wine. Anything that would cheer him up, I guess. That would cheer him up for a while. Um, <clears throat> I made great works. I built houses and vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks, and I planted them all kinds of trees. I made myself pools from which to water and forest grow trees. So he made all these things. He did all these things that, because his heart wanted him to do that. So he wanted to build a bigger house. He built houses, and then he bought male and female servants. I had slaves that were born in my house. I also had great possessions, herds and uh, flocks, more than any who before me. He said, I also gathered for myself silver and gold and treasures uh, and from the kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, many concubines, the delight of the sons of man. 
And so I became great, and I surpassed all that were before me. In verse 10, and whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. And what was his conclusion after all that? All is vanity and striving after the wind. So that is exactly what these rich people were doing. They were not holding back. They were, they were uh, living self-indulgently. Um, and it's all vanity. I think we learned that uh, certainly many times over. And then verse 6, he kind of, he finishes by saying an unusual verse. says, you have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. So that verse kind of implies here that somehow the rich would gain some of their wealth through murder, by condemning and murder, either condemning in their own mind that that poor guy, I needed his land, I'm just going to do away with him, or a lot of time, this time, maybe through the court system that was... Um, um, corrupt at that time, and, and these would be the wealthy person, so they had the influence, and they would somehow convince the court system that their possessions did not belong to him, but belong to them. Either way, they were doing this to a righteous person, and that righteous would signify that he's morally upright, he's innocent, it, it's, it's his stuff, he's, he's the one that's being uh, um, uh, misused, I guess we'll put it that way. And then it's interesting, he puts at the end, he does not resist. The righteous person does not resist. That is a direct teaching of our Lord, right? Uh, not to resist, though, in, in Matthew 5, 31, it, that's just the followings of Jesus. Uh, but I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil, okay? But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, you turn to him the other also, and if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let them have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, you go with them two miles. So not resisting those evil persons are what uh, Jesus has taught and what Jesus followed uh, throughout his lifetime as well. In 1 Peter 2.23, Peter tells us this about Jesus. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. And when he suffered, he did not threaten but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. So this wealth that James is, this wealthy people, um, we must understand here, the wealth is, is, is given to us by God, right? He distributes it as he sees fit. It should not be hoarded. It should not be obtained by dishonest means. It should not be used for an indulgent lifestyle but used for the purpose of providing for your family and glorifying God. Um, so a lifestyle that gives evidence otherwise uh, that he describes here um, really demonstrates an unregenerate heart and one that loves money in the world and not God. But Paul gives us a, a in his letter to Timothy, he says, for the rich of this age, this is how they should be. James has just told us how many of them can be and the judgments that's coming on him in this passage. But Paul tells us then in 1 Timothy chapter 6 that this is the way they should handle their wealth. It says, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, prideful, okay, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. We have learned that on the last several pages, the uncertainty of riches in these times. But on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy, everything we need, everything we need to enjoy life in Him. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future. Not storing up treasure in this world, but not storing up wrath in the next world, but the good foundation for the future, for the, for the eternal life to come, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. So that is, that is our, our goal. But this is used as a very, uh, uh, it's a diatribe, it's really a, a, a rebuke, a severe warning to the, uh, those that would do otherwise. Those that their heart and their lifestyle would show that their wealth is not as they say it's for me to use, not for, not for God. So, so let's take that as a warning even to us that we won't be deceived by the riches and the things of this world and fall into this pattern of life. All right, let's pray and then we'll have a little time of fellowship.
Father, again, we, we thank you so much for the word that you have placed down here. And I pray that, that I myself will take this as a warning and that we all uh, understand what is at stake here. So, Lord, just give us that uh, desire to love you more and more and hold the things of this uh, world and life loosely in our hands. Dear Lord, thank you for this time. In your son's name, amen.